Hey guys, um, I wanted to start off by saying we had some tef technical difficulties. I'm getting tongue tied. And uh, we started off a little late. A couple of you guys, I think 20 or 30 people snuck in uh, from YouTube. So welcome to you guys too. That was pretty cool, sneaking in. So, uh, and uh, I'm going to answer a lot of your questions right now. Um, just starting to relax. I just got here and running me around. I got the leash off my neck so uh, I could start. Now I'm going to peek over here every once in a while because Zaza is asking me the questions. And uh, Zaza's real beautiful, so I peek there once in a while. And so, all right, go ahead, answer right. me. What, what's the questions? First question, did the Gambino family look down on the smaller families like the Bonanno and Lucchese and was, were the Genovese the most respected? The Gambinos, to my knowledge, never looked down on anyone. They're all friends of ours, they're all made guys. And uh, there were smaller families and so on and so forth. The Bonanno family had a problem at one time because a lot of them were dealing drugs when we were told not to. Um, they never stopped. They lost the commission seat because of that. So for a while there was only four families on the commission rather than the fifth one. They lost their seat. And that happens very rare, but it does happen occasionally. So that's my answer. Or did you have like a constant, I guess, fear or state of paranoia about, you know, feds, bugs, or informants, or being caught? There's always a, a thought of being caught. caught. You got to be careful with a lot of things that you do. I guess that thought is always in your head. That's why we don't talk too much on phones, even in clubs where we know there's bugs. We get to learn that you're getting waved to. Oh, well, whatever you were doing, <laughs> Richie was waving to you, so something going on? I had to turn my mic on. Can you guys hear me better now? I heard the questions were a little quiet. So anyway, we didn't look down on people in our life. And uh, was that the question? I forgot what the question is now. <laughs> yeah, it was just basically like if you were constantly a little... Now, there's the other technical difficulties when we don't know who the <laughs> fuck is saying what to who. So, okay, let's go again. Let's go. All right, next question. Did you hear about the underboss and boss of the Columbos being taken down several days ago, and do they still commit murders today? I did hear about that bust. Um, most of them I, I did not know. I knew the guy they said was the boss. Andrew Russo, uh, Mush, we used to call him. Matter of fact, if you watch my podcast, when I talked to the guy who was the acting boss when Stymie was killed, that's him, Andrew Mush. Um, I guess some things they didn't learn, they were threatening people. Um, as far as I know, they don't commit murders anymore, which is a smart move. Uh, even threatening people in a way. There's a lot of ways to make money with the Mafia. They really got to stay away from that kind of shit. And uh, that shows a, lo a lot of other mafiosos who are there. I mean, you got to chill a little bit to enjoy life on the outside or you're going to go to prison. Andrew, I mean, some of the charges are very serious. I really have no knowledge of his tapes or his case, but um, he's 80-something years old. Uh, this might be the end of him. Um, so this is a lesson, I guess, not for me, but for people who are in the mafia. You know, make some money, do some bullshit crimes, whatever you do, but um, this is clear stupidity, shaking down a union or whatever you're doing. 
You can make money with them. You can shake them down a little bit. But threats and I'm going to kill you right in front of your wife and kids, that's horse shit. And uh, so <sighs> the rest of the guys, I, I didn't know who they were. You know, one of them, I know their name. There's another guy, a younger guy. Um, he's related to uh, Carmine Persico. He's a, a nephew. Um, his father was Teddy Persico. His name is Teddy Persico Jr. He did a lot of time. I knew him as a kid, tough kid, good guy. He was tough in prison. He had a good, you know, way about him, a good presence. But um, he's caught up again with it. I'm not sure if he's still on parole. If he's on parole, he's facing a parole violation and then another sentence. And, you know, I would think after doing it, and he did quite a, a, a good sizable bit in prison. You would think by this time he would learn his lesson. But then he could talk back and say, dummy, you went back to prison after you got out too. So I guess, you know, some dogs you can't, Teach them new tricks, I guess. All righty, next question. Do you know much about Frank Terry? I hear he was a well-liked boss um, while he had the role and made sure his family all ate. Frank Terry was, his nickname was Funzi. And he was called a street boss. He wasn't a boss. He was a street boss. And they called him that because... Um, Originally, the boss was incognito. He was not known, and they would call people a boss and this and that to confuse the government. So he had that little title. He was a tough guy. I did a video about him, and uh, I guess he was a decent guy. I really didn't know him too well. Uh, I knew a few things about him, but... Uh, and I guess the people around him, uh, if they think he was a good guy, he was a good guy. All right. Next question. What was your reaction once you found out about the tragic events that occurred on September 11th? You know, September 11th, I was in prison. I was in MCC, New York. And um, every day we would go out, or every other day, or when the weather permitted, we would go out for wreck. And it was uh, an 11-story building. So we went out on the roof. There was no yard. We went out on the roof for wreck. And every time I went out there, you know, right across the street, you know, it was, I guess it was a little further than across the street, but it was such a massive building, you would see the Twin Towers. When that happened, they didn't let us out. The whole prison smelled of smoke for a couple of days, maybe a week. And uh, then they started letting us out. I remember the first day I got out, I knew what had happened. It was on the news. It was in the papers. Everybody was talking about it, the guards, the inmates, everybody. But when I went up on the roof, it was the weirdest feeling to turn in that direction and the towers were gone of these enormous, enormous buildings. This is actually on the roof of MCC. The, the 11th floor is the, the highest floor. So I guess you're almost on the, like, considered to be the 12th floor. And it was really small compared to that building. And those buildings were gone. I was in the military when I was a kid. And it just immediately brought me back in time that this was a military move against our country. I had family and friends in New York. I didn't know if any of them died. Um, I was outraged, enraged about it. But it was a weird, weird feeling to come out and not see those buildings. So that was my experience with 9-11 and how I felt. I didn't feel good about it, that's for sure. ever spent any time up in Canada? And if so, what brought you there? Is there a Canadian mob? That's a multiple question. There is a Can Canadian mob. Now, they were never a family. They called them a family up there. They weren't. They belonged to the Badano family. 
It started off the Bonanno family on the Carmine Galente, brought a crew, sent a captain up in Canada um, because of the drug business. It was easy to get heroin and drugs out of Italy into France. It was easy to smuggle the drugs in from France to Canada because there's a lot of Canadians who are French and I guess the restrictions are not you know, very intense. So the drugs got in that way and it, then they snuck it into the United States and the money went to the Bonanno family. Years later, Carmine Galente died, he was killed. I don't know if the Bonanno family still runs it, but it was a crew, a captain and his crew in Canada. I don't know if it changed over the years. I saw a bunch of movies about it. I never really dealt with them. I did go to Canada once. I was going out with this girl, Louise, when I was young. I went with her and her family. They were religious people. I went just to go see a church, some church or something that was in Canada. Everybody went when they went to Canada to visit this church. It was beautiful. I went with them. Not so much for the church, but uh, I was like a puppy with Louise. And uh, I went with her and her family. I knew her brothers. I knew her family very well. So I went on this little trip. Because <laughs> I was interested in Louise, not the church. Okay. Next question. Is there a way to spot a mob guy or somebody associated with the mob without being introduced? It doesn't matter what a guy looks like. He could be wearing a beautiful diamond pinky ring. He could be wearing a suit, shirt, tie. He could look like a gangster, act like a gangster. You cannot recognize it unless you are introduced. Even if you know for sure this guy is a made guy or a captain, you can't introduce yourself. Someone has to introduce the two of you as a friend of ours, and that's the only way you could recognize him as a friend. I, I'll give you a quick little story. I went to uh, a place in the Westchester Premier Theater in Westchester. And um, there's a guy who took me out and said, listen, there's a guy here, Jimmy the Weasel. He's a boss in California. He wants to meet everybody who's a friend. I'm going to take you over to him. I said, listen, I'm here with my wife. I just got in. I was a pup, really. I didn't want to meet him. I didn't want to walk away from my wife and leave her sitting at a table. And uh, I didn't want to go there. He came over to me and he was ripping mad. Told me, who the fuck do you think you are? You're refusing to come and meet you? I know what you are. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I wasn't introduced to him, so I will not recognize him. He got abusive with me and I said, listen, if you don't get the fuck away from me, you're going to know who I am because I'm going to knock your fucking teeth right down your throat. Get the fuck away from me. You know who I am? No, I don't know who you are and I don't give a fuck who you are. And he left. Paul called me in a day later, two days later, and he said, uh, did you do this with somebody who's recognized to be a boss? And I said, I didn't know him. I wasn't introduced to him. He's talking to me like uh, I'm a made guy. I w I'm not supposed to do that. Am I poor? No, no, you did right. Months later, he said, Sammy, he isn't, he's not a boss, number one. Number two, he's cooperating with the government. So you did the right thing. So you're not supposed to recognize a guy because of the clothes or how he carries himself. I knew a lot of guys who acted real tough. You would swear that he was a mob guy and he was nothing. He, wasn't, he was a wannabe wise guy, and he acted the part. If you're a wise guy, don't act the part. It's a secret society, and uh, stop acting. If you want to act, go to Hollywood. All right. Why did John pick Frankie Lacasio to be a part of the administration in the family at the time? How was that decision made? Franklin Lucasio was loyal to John. He was a tough guy. He was in the Bronx, 
the Bronx faction and everybody respected him quite a bit. So bringing him in brought in the whole Bronx faction. It was a smart move on John's part. I don't know what kind of relationship they had prior to that. He might have known him for years, he might have liked him. I'm not sure why he made that kind of decision. We don't question each other on different decisions. Whatever his thinking was, I never asked and I was never told. Did you ever know an Albanian gangster or did you ever have problems with Albanians? I did know Albanian guys who were real tough. You could call them gangsters. Um, I never had a problem with them. They were always pretty good. Um, some of them knew my family, my kids, my daughter and people growing up. They were younger than me. They seemed like good guys. Um, and a couple of other Albanians I met who were full of shit, make-believe gangsters. Now, I don't want to put names out, and I don't want to do that. Some of you might know who I'm talking about. It's full of shit. Everything the guy says is bullshit. And it's weird because an Albanian guy talked to me not too long ago. And uh, he mentioned the guy's name. And I said, I'd really rather not talk about people behind their back. I'm a type of guy, I like to talk to you face to face. And he said, I just wanted to tell you, Sammy, we're so disappointed in this guy. We're ashamed of him. So that was it. So I'll make you guys try to guess who is who and who's what. <laughs> okay, outside of business, what were some of your favorite spots or things to do either just like in the city or Long Island? Well, Long Island I had not only my mother and father lived out there and I used to travel out there. When I was a kid, I went there a lot, you know, growing up. I had a lot of cousins, um, the Catalano family, um, they're related to me. Uh, my cousin Richie Frischer and the Frischer family a lot of them, my uncles and aunts and people. So there was a lot of people I knew out there, family out there, extended family. And I got to know a lot of people because I went there so many times back and forth. I even moved there for a while with my wife. It was short lived, but I stood there for a while. Um, and as far as where do I relax, I, the, the best place, and I've said it many, many times, when I got more situated in the mob and I was doing a million things and I wanted a place to go, I got a farm, I bought a farm in Cream Ridge, New Jersey. My kids were young. I got them horses, ponies, mini bikes. It was a big place, 30 acres. We had a track on there and we had great, great times. That was a, a retreat for me that I, when I pulled away over there, I was almost like a different person, playing with the kids and watching them play with, you know, horses and stuff. Me and my wife and my whole family, my kids loved it, my wife loved it. I wound up losing it. I got in trouble in a tax case and I had to sell either my home or the farm. And I wound up selling my home, uh, not my home, my farm. And, uh, but I loved that place and I, that was like a retreat for me. I loved doing that. Every year I picked up with my wife and my children, some of my nieces and nephews and relatives or street guys with their families, and we would go on vacation to Florida, Puerto Rico one year. We went to a bunch of, every year I went on vacation. Um, different places, Florida, like that's a big deal. Uh, we all went to Florida and uh, at the right time of the year. So uh, I relaxed a lot. And then there's a lot of little bonuses. I relaxed a lot. There's a lot of little, <laughs> there's a lot of times where you could have a drink with a girl and relax and I'm not saying I was cheating on my wife. Is she here? <laughs> so there's a lot of good times I did have. I have a sense of humor. So with my crew, we used to laugh and joke 
we didn't just come out and beat up people and do this. We joked and laughed and had a great time, just like I do now with my team. I got a great team. They're, they're, they're not as vicious as my old team, but uh, they're great. We laugh, we joke, we have fun. We just went away um, for a week, and uh, we went to meet Patrick, and of course he's doing that uh, thing with uh, the sit down that I had with Michael Franchis, and I went away, Zaza came with me, and uh, we had uh, meetings over there, and uh, see, like my crew. She's like my bodyguard. She came, she came because I'm horrible with tech, spelling, writing, so she's great. She watches all that. And uh, we went to dinner a few times with a bunch of people there. We had some meetings there. I think we had a great time. Matter of fact, I had a driver. They gave me a driver who would drive me around. It wasn't a limo, but it was a beautiful car. And uh, we went to uh, a place that in California, it was uh, an artsy, fartsy place. Florida. You said California? Oh, no. Did I say California? Yeah, yeah. We really were in Florida? I, th <laughs> I always thought yes. we were in California. <laughs> but anyway, we went to Florida, and this, they, they draw graffiti, not graffiti, art, on the walls. It was really bo uh, beautiful. We took some pictures and stuff. There's some of her leaning against the wall. I was the photographer. There was some she took of me. Um, we were almost robbed, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we got away. So. Alrighty, next one. Um, oh, this person says, I'm fascinated that you made it out of the supermax with your sanity intact. How do you cope with isolation and stress like that on a daily basis? Do you think that your health absorbed some of the shock and saved your sanity? I think your health absorbs some of the shock. I was in there for quite a while. I did six and a half years in the hole. If it wasn't, a lot of times I was moved out of there because I had different cases going, multiple cases at the same time. And anywhere I went, I was always in the hole for six and a half years straight. What I found is that we, as humans, we could endure incredible things. We don't even know what we can endure until you get to it. On my last trip to Florida, I was sitting next to a woman and she recognized me and we were talking a little bit. And she asked me the same question. And I said, God forbid this plane crashes. And we land on a little island, me and you alone. And we have nothing. Absolutely nothing. Soon as we land, we're going to say, our life is over. We won't live a week or two or three. Two years later, we'll be sitting there and say, how did we get through this? Because we threw a rock and hit a fish and we were able to eat. We were able to bring down some branches and cover ourselves. We were able to live. We were able to survive. We could do things that we thought we wouldn't be here. But two years later, we are here. Women have babies. <sighs> if you grab a watermelon to a girl who's never had a baby and give them that watermelon and say, you're going to give birth to this, they will tell you it's impossible. It could never happen. It won't happen. It does happen. It's extremely painful. It's but they endure through love of that life in their body. So many things are amazing in life when you think about what we could do. So I don't know if that answers your question. I hope it does. If not, I'm not going to say it. All right, ask me another question. <laughs> All right. Before I get stupid. <laughs> could you give a few tips or a tip on running a legit business and something that you feel always puts you in the direction of success? Running a legit business is no different than being in the mob and running a union or a union business or one of your businesses as a, as a gangster. 
you need to be honest, sincere. These things come back in full. You got to take care of the people around you. You got to do the right thing in life. In a conversation with my son one day, I was talking to him about it, and he gave a great expression of what you have to do. People, corporations, they're all like a beautiful potted plant. You gotta take care of this plant. You gotta water it. You gotta do things for this plant. If you don't, it'll dry up and it'll die. A business is no different than a human being you have to do that. If you don't care about your workers, your employees, your team, whatever you want to call them, if you don't care about your corporation and you just rape it every time there's money, you take it down, you're going to fail. You need to keep the money in the banks so that when something comes up, you're piling up the money, you can make a decision. I think I'm going to take a shot and do this. You have enough money to do it. So business it's complicated in a lot of ways, but it's simple in a lot of ways. It's what you put into it. That's what you're going to get back. Another guy told me one time, a business is like a golden goose who lays golden eggs. Now, you could take those eggs and spend it and live buy a beautiful car, beautiful clothes, beautiful broads, do whatever you want. The first bump you hit, you're going to go broke. You have to take care of that corporation as your golden goose. Baby it. Take care of it. Take those eggs and put them on the side. Take care of that goose. You'll survive. Alrighty. Next one, can you describe the feeling of the mob world immediately following the commission hit? Were there any changes that were just immediately noticeable? Or commission trial, I'm sorry, misspoke. Okay, the com commission trial, after that trial, for me it was heartbreaking. I knew most of the people who were arrested, all the bosses, and through the years I knew them, Fat Tony, Tony Ducks, all of these guys. It was heartbreaking. They were really, really good people. Now in the Mafia, there were bad people. But even people who were a little dangerous could be beautiful, good people, and they were, these guys were. I guess there are people who would disagree with some of that, but that's the way I look at it. And when it was heartbreaking to see them at that age, and they did so many good things for so many different people. And the Mafia has a habit of doing good things for legitimate people as well. I've said it a bunch of times. There could be women in a neighborhood, beautiful women, beautiful bodies, very sexy, very everything. They're our women. We won't permit you to rape them. We won't permit you to fuck with them in a stupid way. The men, they're hardworking people like our moms and dads were. We don't permit you to fuck with them that easy. There's guys who did. There's a bunch of stories. But I'm telling you the other side of it. So we survived pretty good in neighborhoods. A lot of neighborhoods, you'll see it in movies. They welcome us, welcome us very much. I always told a story, a guy would tell his wife when she's going out with the baby in the baby carriage, well, maybe I don't want to walk there. There's a whole bunch of them. No, no, walk right there. They're telling them to walk right there because they know, first of all, we're not going to hoot and howl at them like construction workers would do. And we're not going to let anybody bother them. We look at people in our neighborhood as our people. We might not even know them, but that's how we look at them. So I'm sure there's a lot of stories, positive and negative, and 
But I look at all of those stories, and a lot of those guys did a lot of positive things. And it did change the mafia. It changed how it was. I think it hurt the mafia. And some people are proud of that. But I think it hurt our neighborhood because they were replaced by a bunch of scummy people who didn't care about those women, didn't care about the men, didn't care about the kids. And they had no control anymore. So all those little so-called bad guys, whatever they were, whatever you want to call them, ran rampant. I think now, I also know a lot of cops and agents now, as you know. And the craziest thing is that a lot of them tell me that same thing. Sammy, it was so different when you guys were there. This girl, Gabby, I don't know her last name, I forgot her last name, Gabby, who Petito. just got killed. Petito, I think is her last name, or Petito or something? Petito. Yeah. But we know who I'm talking about, Gabby. Her boyfriend, I guess, he killed her. And his name was Brian Laundry or something like that. And uh, there's a program, I did a little interview with them, cops off the cuff. And I'm looking on YouTube and they were making statements. They're real angry at, at this kid. And uh, so is everybody. And it said comments. So I wanted to put a little comment down. I put my comment down. I said, I wish the mafia hunts this dog down like the cops are doing as well. Be a little weird, the mafia and the cops looking for this guy. His story turns my stomach. So, I don't know, go to the next question because I don't want to hang too much with this story because it just, it really irritates the shit out of me. Alrighty, next one. If they were to make a movie based on the episodes of your podcast, what actor would you like to see play yourself? I think I answered this question before. I said it's up to the producers and directors. They know, you know a lot more about this than me, and they could do whatever they want, but I will tell them if they pick Danny DeVito, I will come and kill one of them. So you producers, make sure you know who you pick for, to play me. <coughs> and I want to say another thing. I'm actually talking to people and working on making this. Right now it would be not a movie, it's going to be a scripted show. And I'm talking to some real heavyweights. And uh, I hope to get this out. And I hope to see it before I die. I, that's my goal. I would really love to sit down. But either way, I want to get it out because I want my ex-wife, my children, my grandchildren, my future great-grandchildren to watch this and say, that's my poppy. That's my real grandfather. And I'm not going to make them hide anything. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I want at least the truth to come out. There's a lot of things I'm talked about that are not true. I let it slide. I, I'm, I got thick skin, I just let things slide. It annoys me to hear that some of these things that are not true about me. I don't mind what somebody says, I did something when I did it. But uh, if I have anything to say with this movie, and I will, you're gonna see the true me. I don't know if you're gonna like me or, or hate me or whatever it is, but I'm gonna tell you one thing, when you walk out, you're gonna know that's Sammy the Bull. And that's the true side of the Mafia. He was on both sides, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, go on. Yeah. This question kind of 
follows up that one. Since you said you would like to see it before you die, do you have any other like bucket list items or things you would like to see or do? Uh, bucket list. Is this a guy who's asking me this question? <laughs> I don't know. The username, I can't really tell. All right, all right. Don't tell me his <laughs> name or her name. So I'm not going to get crazy. But a bucket list. A bucket list. I'm obsessed with helping my ex-wife, and she's my ex, but I love her with all my heart and soul. My daughter, my son, my grandchildren. The only thing I could give is me and what I have to them and leave them. I hope they enjoy that. I hope they remember me. What more could you want than that? I don't, never gave a shit about clothes, jewelry, cars, all the bullshit. And, uh, but that's what I'd like to leave. Alrighty, next one. So currently, prison is just a big business. What ideas do you have for prison reform or prisoner rehabilitation? And what do you think could benefit pr prisoners and society? Now, obviously, I got 22 years in prison, so I've given that a lot of thought of many, many different times, especially so many people that I've met. Everybody has the ability to change and to change their life. I've done it. I got in trouble again. It's a long story, so I'm not going to get into that, but I did get in trouble again, and I went away on a 20-year hit. But... A lot of people, I watch the news and they'll say, why is there so much recidivism? That's something where you go out and you recommit a crime. I couldn't even say the word, but you know what I'm talking about. You get a lot of guys there, they're not stupid. They made mistakes, they did things, they were in prison. Now, I won't go overboard. Some people deserve to be in prison. I deserve to do the 22 years. But when you shut the door on people because they went to prison, and there's a lot of guys, drug dealers, and all kinds of people who made a lot of money. So now this guy gets out. So he can't be a doctor, he can't be a lawyer, he can't be a dentist, he can't be shit. Every door is closed in their face. There's guys who know, who I know, who try to drive a truck, but it had hazardous waste. He can't drive a truck. Schooling is shut in their face. So the guy was making 20, 10, 20, 30,000 a week. You want this guy to come out and work for McDonald's flipping hamburgers for fucking $10 an hour, $12 an hour. What's so shocking about him committing another crime? When you shut all of these doors, the length of the time you put people away, I've seen people in prison doing 10, 20 years, life sentences for selling pot. All right, they were a big distributor of pot. It don't make any sense to me at all. Then I'll see, I did eight, almost 18 years straight on this last crime. I lent people money. I did some stupid stuff like that. Then I'll see a guy who... They're letting him out in five, six, seven years. And he's a fucking child molester. Where's the sanity in this? There's guys who've committed murders. Bro, they could come home and live in my house. That's how much they've changed their lives. And there's a gang of them that I met. Not everybody. I wouldn't let everybody live in my house, but a lot of them could and should be given an opportunity. They come here, they're born here, they're raised here, they're somebody's husband, son, whatever. Give them another opportunity. Give them four, five, six, eight, ten years, whatever it may be. These twenties and thirties and fifties and life without parole sentences that are handed out by our Justice Department are completely and totally ridiculous. 
And when you get these people back into society, put them in the AVX superbanks, put them in the hole. Take away everything that they're about, their pride, everything. What do you think you're going to come out with? You think these guys are going to come out? And I've seen the light, brother, or they're going to break your fucking hole. They're not going to come out with a good attitude. They're going to be bitter. That's what we're creating. Again, there's some people who deserve to be in prison. Some of these guys who I've, who I've seen, tough guys, have changed their life. They could be out. A pedophile could never be out. He does never change his life. He's always willing to abuse another kid. And they don't get those kind of sentences. It's ass backwards. So that's prison reform. People who understand it, the, the people who run prisons, the wardens, the unit manager, the counselor, they should have an input on who should get a break. They live with these people every day. They know who's good and they know who's bad. I don't think they have a legitimate input. Their job is just to house you. And in some of those unit managers, they think their job is to abuse you as well. Not only take your freedom away, but to abuse you. They have some programs in prison I saw. One time when I was in, they said, Sammy, go to this educational program. You, you might be able to get a couple of months off. I said, all right. So I went. It was a teacher, woman teacher, big fat ass. 12 o'clock, she would be there. And we would open up the class, 11.30. OK, it's 12 o'clock. It's lunchtime. <laughs> She'd run to the kitchen because she's getting free lunch. And we'd eat lunch. OK, let's meet back at 1 o'clock. We go back at 1 o'clock. At 1.30, I have another meeting. I'll see you tomorrow. What did I learn, bro? What did we learn? One guy turned around and said, Sam, you know what we learned? That this fat ass is going to come here to eat lunch every day. <laughs> we might get a couple of months off because we went to this class. Get legitimate classes. And not everything is college. You could teach a guy how to be a plumber, carpenter, trades, jobs, interviews, doing all kinds of things. They should be people who are trustees, more or less. Put them on the border in towers, not guns, looking out for people running across, helping the border, border patrol people. Then maybe he can get a break and get out. When they know they can make a, a get out and change their life and they can get a break, you're going to change the way people come out of prison. Now, I know. We could do everything under the sun. There'll be that one bastard who'll come out and do something really crazy. And then we'll blame everybody who's in prison. We'll take all those programs away from all of them. They'll all get screwed. I'm going to give you a quick story. In New York, they brought, the feds brought this, is, what do you call that when you have a conjugal visit? Conjugal visit. A conjugal visit is there's a trailer in a small yard, swing set. Your wife could come in. In the back, you could have the kids. When you go in the trailer, you could get a little nook-nook, a little nooky, uh, and have some fun, and start to revisit family life and be happy. Here's what happened. In the prison, you'd go on a list to get it. If you had any kind of bullshit, your name went to the bottom of the list again. You know what happened? There was no more violence in that prison. Nobody wanted to break rules. Everybody wanted that little vi visit. One guy went on a visit. Had a beef with his wife, killed her, put her under the bed. Visit's over. They go there. 
the woman is dead. They took the program away. One guy. One guy. Thousands of people lost that privilege. Thousands of people who could have been reformed with these type, type of things. It was taken away for one person. They had to move that person because in the prison, they wanted to kill him. It screwed up the whole thing. It stayed in some New York prisons. I think it's still in effect, maybe. You could check. In the feds, they just dropped it. Let's get away from this. We don't want bad publicity. The, bu the publicity that you should get, the bad publicity, is me saying what you did Thousands of people could have been reformed. Maybe that guy who killed his wife in prison, you could give him a double life, triple life, stick him in the ADX Supermax, because he's a psycho. You have some place for him. But you hurt so many people who were benefiting it, from it. Society was benefiting with that program. So that's prison reform. That's the way I look at prisons. There was people I wanted to stay away from in prison. I don't want to stay, forget about being in the street. I don't even want to be in jail with them. But the, 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 the warden and the unit manager and the counselor, they know who they are. They know what I was. So it depends on a lot of things, on prison reform. Someday maybe I'll write a book about pr prison reform and the pros and the cons. I probably could do that, especially if I could shout out to hundreds, if not thousands of people I met in prison. Come and see me, bro. We could talk together. I'll give you a piece of the book. We'll sell it. We'll whatever. Prison reform, somebody's got to care. And who's making those rules, <laughs> they don't care. All right, good. All right. Before I get put back, because they're going to get mad at me. Like, <laughs> What are you think would have happened with the Mafia if Paul Castellano wasn't decided to be taken out? I, I think that when Paul was decided to be taken out, he was on a downhill track. He lost touch with the good part, and he was doing crazy things that I'm going to talk about in my podcast, it'll be in my movie, or scripted show, um, I think it would have got worse. We probably would have killed the whole Gotti and his whole crew. A lot of them didn't deserve to die. That would have happened, for sure. And at that point, I don't know, maybe a mafia war would have broke out anyway. I really don't know. But when Frankie DeChico talked to me and told me, Sammy, it's time for him to go. And it was about a lot, of, a lot of different issues. I have my own issues, personally, but I'm not going to get into that. And uh, what I did make my decision on was, wasn't my personal issues. I wanted to leave that out on what he was doing to everything else. And I was convinced it was time for him to go on all those other issues. And at the same time, we could save John Gotti and his whole crew. And we could try and bring it back to what it once was. But it obviously didn't work. All righty, next question. I would love to hear what your reaction was when you learned that Greg Scarpa had not only been an informant, but had been one for such a long time. The weird part about finding out about Greg Scarpa being an informant is that the Mafia knew that for such a long, long time. Way before I became made, they knew when I was in the Colombo family and I was in my 20s. Why they didn't take him out, I don't know. I really don't know. One time I'll tell one story is that he went to Joe Colombo. Joe Colombo was the boss. And he told Joe Colombo, they're going to raid your house tomorrow. 
Joe Colombo said, how do you know? He said, I bunked into a guy in a bar. I think he was a cop. And in a conversation, he told me. And he left. Joe Colombo's house was raided the next day. But does anyone believe that he bunked into some cop who's going to be on a high-level organized crime strike force team, met him in a bar, and just because he liked him or whatever the fuck it was, for no reason, you don't even know the guy, he told you? He tried to win a favor with that. I helped the boss. But to me and to other people, he disclosed the fact that he had inside information. Verified the next day. The only one who could get that is a cop or an informant. So they knew about him for a long time. There's many, many more stories. Why they didn't kill him, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. So, I mean, there's all kinds of speculation. I don't want to talk about speculation. Uh, there's speculation that Carmine Persico knew, but he was a rat too, and that's why he didn't do anything. I knew Carmine Persico well. It's hard for me to believe that he was. I doubt it, to be honest. So that, that's why I don't want to speculate. Maybe that was the reason why I didn't kill him. I don't know. But all kinds of uh, speculation about it. His son, who was just as almost as dangerous as his dad, just got out of prison after doing 32 years. He was an informant too. So, and he didn't get killed either. So, go on. Yeah. Um, given your skill set, do you think that you could have been a Navy SEAL or some type of special forces? Yes. I got drafted into the Army in 1964. I was 19 years old. And I went through infantry, advanced infantry, and then I went into another thing with communications. I asked, I wanted to go to Ranger training. But when you got drafted, you only went in for two years. When you joined, you joined for three. And then you could re-enlist and do whatever you want. So they had told me, well, you don't have enough time to go through the ranger training, but what we can do is put you down and make you enlist so that you have three years instead of two. No, I'm not, I'm, two years is more than enough. So I didn't go into it. But could I, I mean, I, I was in tremendous, I was, I was never tall, but I was, in tremendous physical condition at 19 years old. Um, I think I could have did it very easily. I wanted to because they do have all kinds of skills that I found very interesting. It's, it wasn't about just killing people or doing shit like that. It was, you know, they go through mountains, through rivers, through this, through that. They do a lot of really complicated things. And then you go through, it's about a two month course of airborne training. So I would have been an airborne ranger. You're jumping out of planes with a parachute. You're learning you have skills on how to do all of that stuff. So I really found that interesting, and I wanted to do it. Do, you, do I think I could have done it? Yes. I was very physically uh, strong. Um, I was good with sports when I was young. So I, I think I could have did it easy. I would, we would go run in the morning or take a long hike and I never had a problem doing anything physical in prison. And there was a lot of guys who got drafted uh, uh, who were not physically fit. They were, you know, in the office jobs and different kinds of jobs or overweight or whatever. You know, it was hard on them. But it really wasn't that hard on me. I mean, I was in real good shape. So I guess I could have been a Navy SEAL or a... Uh, a ranger or something like that. Okay, do you have any inside legends or stories about the origins of the Mafia and how it started? 
Oh, uh, yes. But here's how I'm going to answer that. I, I, I really do. It started, I'm going I'm to give a very brief. It started in Sicily. Only Sicily, not the other part of Italy. When people invaded Italy, they actually wanted to go to Rome. That's where the money and the real prize was. In Sicily, there were only farmers and peasants. But they would pull in with these wooden ships, 50, 80, 100 guys. They had to wait for more and more and more ships. So they stayed in Sicily. They needed an army to go take Rome. Rome, the Roman army, the Roman Empire, we all know the stories. They were very powerful. But Sicily was not. But those farmers and peasants stuck together against these foreign invaders. And they formed clans. From clans, it became the mafia. They fought these people off. And they really didn't have guns and weapons, so they went through a lot of abuse. That's where it started. I'm going to be telling this on SammyTheBull.com is my new website. And um, I talked with some guys who are, uh, what do you call that when they, uh, huh? Historians. Historians. They did about five, six, seven years of work. So I'm talking with them and they're giving me a lot of insight in the past. I'm up in age. My guy Tato was 20, 30 years older than me. So if he was alive now, he'd be a hundred and something years old. So I really know a lot about it, and I'm going to talk about it on my website, on my website, sammythebull.com. And I might even do reenactments and everything, because I'm talking about doing all kinds of things on this show that I find very, very interesting. I'm doing these, or trying to do, these shorts. It's a short film. Six, eight, ten, twelve minutes long. And uh, it's about a story based on a true story, but it's Hollywood. And you're going to do this little movie, more or less, that you could see. So I'm working on things like that. And uh, that's where I'm going to talk about the history of the mafia, where it started, how it started, why it started, started and how it came to the United States. So I'm, that's as far as I'm going to go with that. So if you come on my website, it's not there right now, but I'm working on that, and it will be on my website. All righty, we have like 60 seconds left. Huh? Let me see if I can throw. I got 60 seconds left. Give yeah, me a question. Yeah, we can there throw we one more in there. Um, okay, if you could start a legit business today, anything you wanted from scratch, what would it be? For real? That's yeah. a complicated question. Give me another question. That's oh, my too, God. <laughs> that's too complicated. <laughs> That'll be a 20-minute <laughs> Okay, what do you think of the mob's resurgence in the last couple of years, especially in, like, South Philadelphia and Joey Merlino's crew gaining traction again? No, Joey Molino gaining traction. I don't know what he's gaining. They say he's the boss. I don't know him. I saw some things about him. Uh, I don't know. They, they say he's like John Gotti, fancy with the clothes, with the this. I knew his father very well. Um, Chucky, they would call him. I mean, I knew him very well. He was very close with Nicky Scafo when Nicky Scafo took over the family. The first guy he put in as the underboss was Molino's father, Chucky Molino. And, uh, and then he got taken out. Not killed, but he, he, he had a drinking problem and they took him off and put him on his side. And other people got in there. So I don't know about too much about this Joey Molino, other than what I read like you guys do. Um, they're there. I have a lot of respect for them in a way that I think they're using their head. They're not killing people like what happened in my days. There was bodies all over the place. They're not doing that anymore. And that's a smart move. 
the government has these agents, agents, 14, 15, 16 of them, they're working on a crime family, each crime family. Now, I do know a lot of them, and they said, what happened is, being they don't kill people no more, don't do certain things, they reduce the number of people watching you guys. Now, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but they reduced it down to four people instead of 14 people. So now you're not taking the heat. And they put their heat onto, what is that, uh, that game, huh? MS-13, different gangs that are violent. They take the agents and they go after them to protect society. So you're not as much of a threat to society. So you're using your head. Do your little crimes, your little whatever that you make them, uh, betting, sports, and Shylocking and stuff like that. I don't think they have such a tremendous inf influ uh, interest in that stuff. So you could probably get away with that shit. I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because I'm thinking I'm going to get a visit by the FBI and say, why don't you shut your fucking mouth? <laughs> what we're doing and stuff. So, whatever. At least it benefits society. You're not a threat, and that's a good thing. People are not going to look at you in a disgusting way. I mean, when we kill each other, when we do things like that, people don't like it. And going back to that crew who just got arrested, you know, if you push on them a little bit to get some of the pie, whatever your little scam is, but when you're starting to tell them, I'll kill you, I'll kill you right in front of your wife and kids and... Enjoy your stay in prison now, stupid. So all you guys out there, good luck. And if you want to uh, come on my show and give me a thousand bucks for all this information I just gave you, uh, it's very welcome. <laughs> okay, that's it. Adios, motherfuckers. Go bay. Go bay. I don't even know what I said.